Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Aryan. I'm a second year dental student based in the UK. And today I wanted to talk about something quite important. Um, so before applying to dental school, I was thinking about maybe applying to Eastern Europe as well. And this is really something that I think a lot of you guys might be thinking about as well. So I've been thinking about making a video on this topic, but because obviously I don't study in Eastern Europe, I thought it's not fair. So I've got a pro here who's actually been through the whole process to talk to me and you guys about what is it like to study there and what is the whole process to actually apply there and study there. So yeah, Hassan, do you want to tell me a bit about your journey and um, maybe introduce yourself to everybody? Yeah, uh, hi guys, thanks for watching. Um, I am Hassan, Hassan Akhtar. Uh, I am a fourth year dental student at the moment and I study at the University of Plovdiv in Bulgaria. And yeah, it's been quite a journey. It's, um, I mean, it's not something I really went for straight after college. Um, it took me a while to decide to go for this and, you know, um, try different things before going for dentistry. But um, today, like looking at where I am now, I'm very happy that I chose the path that I am doing. You know, um, I get to travel while studying, met amazing people that I'm really close to. Um, you know, I'm exploring a new culture, living in a new place. And at first, obviously it's daunting and you're thinking, oh, it's a bit different, it's Eastern Europe, but it's actually been amazing. It's actually been amazing for me, yeah. That's amazing that you're enjoying it and, and it's all going good. But what was it, how did, you, how did you come to decide that you want to go to Eastern Europe? Did you think about applying to the UK first? What, what, what happened? I took a, I had to take a year out in college because I was unwell, unfortunately. So due to that, I mean, I had always had, um, thank, you know, I have family members who are doctors. So, you know, medicine has always been something that has, you know, piqued an interest in me, um, simply because I'm helping people. And um, I've always, you know, that's before dentistry, medicine was number one for me. So I applied for medicine in the UK. Um, Unfortunately, I missed my grade by one mark, um, so I had to take a gap year and decide what I really wanted to do. Either I retake the A-level that I missed the mark on or maybe try something else. So I thought, okay, um, there was a course called Clinical Sciences at the University of Bradford. So it's like a pre-medical course. So I applied for that and I started that. So what happens is you do a foundation year and if you get 70% then you can transfer to Leeds Medical University and unfortunately that year was unwell again so <laughs> that didn't work out so then um, I thought okay um, you know lurking at the back of my mind the option of going abroad was there but it wasn't something I was ready to accept like let me do this so at that time after that first year at University um, of Bradford I thought okay let me apply for Varna um, simply because I like beaches so I thought okay this looks like a nice place to study so I did apply and I did get a place but um, I also had another chance at Bradford University so you can do another year and transfer to second year uh, medical school of Leeds so I thought okay let me stay and do that plus I had like a lot of good friends at Bradford so I thought you know let me just stay put and see what I can do with this so and that was one of the best years at uni for me like it was amazing uh, we've done you know we got to dissect cadavers at Leeds University I got to meet a lot of uh, you know professors and learn with them and teach as well and it was just such a great experience for me and it was very like we were literally learning year one of medicine so it was something a bit different to what I've done before and then I was like, I really want to study medicine, you know, I, want, I was really interested in nephrology and the kidneys, uh, even visit patients who were on dialysis, so that was very interesting. So uh, I got the grade for that year, but unfortunately I didn't get an interview. It's very, very selective and it's very competitive, you know, 80 people going for something that's only 20 people can get into is a bit, you know, difficult. So uh, I thought, okay, what do I do now? And, um, you know, a lot of my friends were staying put to finish the degree and then you can apply for medicine postgraduate which I was going to do. But, you know, I sat with my family and, you know, dentistry was, it, I had never said it to them, but it was always something that I was interested in as well. Um, only because even with medicine, I like things about aesthetics and making people feel good about themselves. So if I did go into medicine, that would be something, for example, cosmetic side of medicine is something I'd go into. So dentistry is very cosmetic. I feel like there's so many things you can do with that. and. Um, I just had a moment in my life where I just thought about it and I thought, what do you want to do now? Like, think seriously, you have two options. You either go abroad and study dentistry, because unfortunately there, were, there, wasn't, there wasn't any option for me to do dentistry in the UK. Um, there's no like f foundation courses, because for the foundation courses, 
you, you they only accept people who haven't done science A levels, and I have. So either I stay put, do medicine, or go abroad and do dentistry. <laughs> so you know, uh, discussing my family who are very supportive, um, I came to the decision to go to Bulgaria and start dentistry. And I spoke with a lot of people who are dentists, and um, you know, I just weighed up my options and thought about myself and what I wanted. And yeah, it started then in 2017. I applied. <laughs> I mean, that's interesting. You say you you actually started doing pre medicine and you were fully going for medicine and then you didn't suddenly decided no you want to go back and do dentistry now um, I was actually thinking about doing medicine myself as well I actually went and did work experience as well but it was sort of during the work experience that I was like this this is this isn't for me like there was just something from talking to doctors as well I mean medicine is amazing that you know you can you help people there is all sort of different um, ways different uh, sort of professions in medicine this different specialties um if you're interested in manual dexterity there's definitely you can go into surgery um but for me there was this working on call that i didn't really uh, sort of enjoy i wanted to be in a sort of situation where you actually have time and you can focus on um have, have a life as well as well as you know enjoying the whole uh, medicine or healthcare side of things as well so yeah um and did you did you apply to dentistry in the uk at all or did you just did the pre pre-medicine and then off off you go you went to europe to do dentistry i mean no i mean with the pre-medicine i would still have a lot of options so for example if i had my plan was originally if i didn't get into medicine from foundation you have clinical sciences and year one of clinical sciences that you know the direct transfers then I could do two more years finish the degree and apply postgraduate with that I could have applied for dentistry as well so that was still in my mind I thought okay if I finish four years of this degree um, have a degree under my belt then I can apply for dentistry as well so you know I always thought that was a way but you know the thing that that really pushed me to go in abroad was the other aspects, not just dentistry. It was the fact that I, I love traveling, you know, I've been to a lot of, you know, I've been very fortunate with my family from a, from a child traveling to a lot of countries and it's something I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to keep doing. So, you know, and I had friends, I worked at retail just for like a, uh, a couple of years and I've made a lot of friends there and they, they've all like been traveling themselves. So, you know, alone without family and friends and, you know, to mature themselves. And I've always, you know, I've learned from them what their experiences are. And it's something that I've always wanted to put with myself. So everything just came together. I thought, okay, wait, if I do go abroad, these are the experiences I can have. And it's something I've always wanted to do. So that's what really pushed me to go into Bulgaria to do dentistry. I mean, of course I want to do dentistry. It's something I've, I'm now even more passionate about now that I've started it, uh, which is something I'll explain later as to why I chose it because it's weird. Like I kind of went into dentistry knowing I wanted to do it, but didn't fully know if I would like it. So until I started clinics last year, now I know it's something I really want to do and I'm very grateful I chose it because I'm not going to lie, when I saw my first patient, I was scared. I was like, if I, if I don't like doing this, what am I going to do? <laughs> but uh, no, uh, I'm very grateful that it's you know come to this and yeah, it's the traveling and learning about, I've met so many people who are Bulgarians and Turkish people and I've even traveled to Istanbul with my friends uh, from university. Um, four months ago, which was amazing, you know, and it was only a coach trip down. So things like this, I can't do in the UK, you know, if I studied in the UK. So, you know, I feel like I'm, it's been a great experience so far and I've got a couple of years to just do a lot more. Yeah, I suppose those are the perks of studying in Europe and uh, sort of in an international place. Um, and what was the in entry requirements like? So when I applied, it's changed a lot now. Um, I applied in 2017, uh, now it's 2021. It has changed a lot from the students I've spoken to um, uh, in the year below me. So when I applied, what they do is, they did this with mine as well. They use your A-levels and you have a, they convert to their average and everyone's ranked based on their A-levels. So there isn't a certain, oh, you need A, B, C or A, B, B, you know, it's more like whatever, give, me your, give us your grades, we will convert them to points in, in the European side and you will be ranked based on that. Um, so with that, you also have to sit an entry test. Uh, for us, it was an MCQ test, but not an essay test, which wasn't too bad. I mean, personally, I found it okay because I had done two years at university. I've done a lot of biology and a lot of chemistry. So it was something that I, I found okay, um, but you still need to prepare for it. Um, but now I think they also do interviews and an essay um, because a lot more people have been, have been applying to my university in particular. Did you get to 
do the UCAT exam, or it was U called UKCAT before that, would you say it's the entry test is quite similar to, to the UCAT exam, or is, is it a different test? It's completely different. This is uh, purely biology and chemistry and physics. Purely, there's nothing. I mean, I've done UKCAT and BMAT. I had to sit BMAT twice for the needs transfer, and that was difficult, you know. Um, but it was it was not as difficult as that. There's nothing like abstract reasoning or you know things like that. You know, you don't need to do things like that. And and the whole application process. Did, how did how did you go about? So, say I'm I'm I didn't get any offers in the UK, and I want to now think about you know applying to Europe but where do I start from what do I do okay so the first thing I did because I've literally been in that boat um, I networked so I went on the student room and I went on back then nobody on Instagram was studying abroad so I didn't use Instagram it was Insta it was Facebook and the student room and I tried to message so many students in not only Bulgaria in Spain in you know in Valencia in Hungary in Czech Republic and ask them you know how it is first but to start I, um, I went to an agency um, I mean, when I applied to Varna, they told me not to go through an agency. They said it's much easier if you apply directly. Um, but the thing is, you can do that, but you have to then translate all the documents yourself. And you have to know, I mean, I personally don't know where to go for that. You have to find out yourself and how, work out how much it costs. But with an agency, um, they kind of do all that for you. You pay a sum and then, you know, but then with the agency I was with, it's like, they just, you know, I got there, but everything else I had to do myself. Um, find a place to live, uh, which is, I mean, I found it, that wasn't too difficult personally, but a lot of people in my year weren't very happy about that. They expected the agency to do that for you. So, I mean, I feel like if you want to look for an agency, there are like, there's about four or five out there that do this. Just call them and ask them what they offer and then decide yourself what you want to go for. It's completely up to you, but now I feel like everything's on Instagram. Like I'm on Instagram and so many students have already messaged me for advice and stuff. So if anyone wants to ask for advice, they can ask me and I will help them. And you know, I'm already in Bulgaria, so I know where to go and who to speak to if you say want an apartment to live in or, um, you know, how to get there flights wise, anything. So, you know, you can do a bit of both. You can go to an agent or ask somebody online. And which one would you say is it's better? Because I've heard agencies charge a lot of money, especially from somebody who's a student, someone who's just, you know, uh, they didn't get the offer and now they're in a difficult situation and then having to pay this much money not knowing if it's actually worth it. I don't know, uh, there's just something about it. Which, well, How would you say it's better to do it? So the best way to do it is, there's one agent agency I know only because so many of my friends who are still with me in fourth year doing very well have gone through this agency and I didn't go through them because I hadn't heard of them. They're called Interhex and um, they've, I've not heard anything bad from them. For, you know, from like everything's been very smooth. Like my personal friends who I've met there and are still doing medicine and dentistry and are doing very well came through Interhex and you know, they got in straight away. The thing is with the agencies is I feel like they should change the way they advertise because they say like guaranteed place. Agencies can't get somebody into university. They can help you get, you know, contact the university and send the required documents. But uh, uh, right at the end, it's the university that decides if you get in or not. You know what I mean? So, and the thing is as well with these universities is, um, getting in isn't the hard part. It's really not. But staying on is very difficult, very difficult. And I've had like times where, I've had times where like, even I feared that I almost didn't get through to the year and I almost was kicked out. Um, and it was very, very stressful. The exams were very difficult and they were very selective. And I personally, unfortunately, know people who didn't make it and are not studying anymore at my university. So, you know, before you even apply, you have to make sure, you know, you're very hardworking and you're ready to put the work in because they really make you put the work in. They really do. Yeah, I suppose the entry requirements is all it's all a sort of a prediction to see, to select those who can, you know, you can predict that they will perform well and they'll actually make it through this course. But as you say, it does need a lot of effort and hard work after, you know, getting into the degree and actually starting everything. Um, so how, how did you find the move from here to, to go there and starting somewhere where you don't know anybody? 
Yeah, yeah I, I had uh, my mom and my sister and my brothers with me, so like it wasn't as difficult. And I applied with two of the friends from Bradford University. Um, I remember there's a lot of us that wanted to go originally. We had a big group chat, but slowly people were just changing their mind and not they didn't want to go, which is understandable. Even I was a bit scared of going, but um, going f at first was a bit daunting. I mean. Obviously, I arrived at the airport, I arrived at the place, and I'm thinking, you know, for everybody like my family, oh, this is a nice place, you know, we're visiting. But for me, I'm thinking in my head, I'm gonna live here, can I do this? So, obviously, I looked around and I had I had known two people, like I said, that applied with me, but they came at a different time. So, I didn't really know anybody yet at the university. So, I think that scared me more because I didn't know anybody. But, um, living there, I, I think I should talk about when my family left and I started university and I was on my own. That was a bit weird to get used to, obviously, like, I, yeah, and like, I'm at home with a, you know, I have a big family and now I'm like alone in this apartment, but it's been great. I, I, after a week I was fine, I met people and there's so many things to do in Plovdiv, in the, in the town I'm in, and it, in 2019 it became Eastern, I'm sorry, Europe's capital of culture, so, so much was happening, so many tourists were coming in from America and Germany and all, all these countries, and they were spending so much money on like, you know, I've seen I've seen it grow basically. So I remember when I first moved, there was so much like you know roadworks and construction, but now all these buildings have been built and everything's new and you know it looks I mean, it looks amazing. And there's a lot of things you can do there. So you know we had to go karting, bowling, cinemas, shopping, you know all these things, restaurants, halal places to eat. So with your friends that you make, you just go out and I think that's what helps you enjoy it more. Um, knowing people there. And on, on this topic, do you have any any big tips for people who are about to go there and, you know, the moment the, the family leaves them and you're suddenly like, oh, like, you're alone here. You know, well, how would you, would you say you have to be really outgoing, throw yourself out there and just meet people? You don't need to do that. I mean, just first, before even throwing yourself at anybody or meeting people, take that time to adjust yourself. So go out, go to the local stores, talk to people. Most of, them, most of the people, locals in Bulgaria at least, do speak English and they do enjoy speaking to foreign people. So, you know, you want to go grocery shopping, go grocery shopping, find out where it is. You know, we have a little, you know, everything's exactly the same as the UK. Go and buy your stuff, come back home and then set your apartment up. It's pretty exciting. FaceTime the family and then, yeah, if you want to do something in the evening, in the evening I mean, <clears throat> with the agencies, the good thing with the agency is they organise these like student meetups. So you will already have like a, a calendar. A plan so oh at 7 p.m. tonight we're meeting at this place with all these students and you'll be mingling and they'll come naturally so you know don't force anything just go with the flow and um, if you don't go with an agency then just uh, message people message people and ask them oh hey are you also new here do you want to meet up uh, do you want to go shopping together things like that I mean I did that I remember um, one of my friends who's now my best friend in Bulgaria, we worked together really hard. When I first met him, I said to him, I want to come to your place um, and uh, discuss some things because he was becoming the year coordinator or something. So I remember it was raining and it took me about half an hour to find his place because I was so new to the place. But now it's just, I know where he lives. Do you know what I mean? So it's crazy. But you know, things like that. So everyone's different, but do, do put yourself out there. Do meet people. Don't just stay indoors. That's my, my advice. That's pretty much the same as uh, what you experience here. I remember the first day I went to university, the first thing I did was, you know, drop my bag. Um, I got out to find the, the supermarket. That was the first thing, because you need food, right? Honestly, it is like, you, you know, you're literally a local now. So you need to get used to where you're living, where things are, you know, the surroundings. Know where the university is, that's the big thing. You do not want to be late. If you are even five minutes late to a class, they want that you're in. They're very strict. Well, at my university at least, so... Um, even one minute over the clock, one of the lecturers, she would look at the clock and if I... I remember walking one minute late and she says, get out. And I thought, oh my days, I've now got an absence. And if you have two absences, absences in in the semester you're not going to get verified so you know they're very strict on attendance and you know they're very military like you have to be there on time so i'd say spend that time to familiarize yourself with the surroundings and knowing how to get to university <laughs> from where you live yeah and i think you know that attendance is one thing about professionalism isn't it it, it, it matters when you're doing anything like medicine or dentistry uh, where you're going to become a healthcare professional that is very important and that's one thing in the UK, the, the General Dental Council looks at as well. So the next question I have is a bit, one, of, one of the, probably the biggest, in terms of importance, it's the biggest one. And it's something I was thinking about when I wanted to apply, and that was probably the one thing that's kind of stopped me. Um, and it's about finances. 
In the UK, you get to apply for student finance and you don't have to think about anything, you know, that your tuition fee is going to be nine grand. Um, but in Europe, you have to pay that yourself. How, how does it work? How, how much is it? So there are no loans or grants or anything like that. Um, it is basically 8,000 euros for a year, but they take it per semester. So you pay 4,000 as long as you pay before your exams. So for example, the first semester you pay before December, 4,000 euros, then you get a stamp on your book and then you can sit your January exams. If you don't pay, you can't sit your exams. And then it happens again. You, I'm now going into my second semester of fourth year and then they expect me to pay my fees before May because my exams are in May. So then by paying my fees, I'm verified and I can sit my exams. So yeah, it's 4,000 euros per semester. They just, exp um, it's just a bank transfer really, that's it. And the thing is, um, I mean, I get told a lot, asked by a lot of people, oh, so you study abroad, it's cheaper. Not really. I thought it would be, but it's really not. I mean, okay, 1,000 cheaper than nine grand from the UK, fine, but then you're also paying for flights, you're paying for a place to live, you're, play, you're paying for your living expenses and obviously enjoying and things like that, but then you also expect to pay for your books. So the university don't provide the books for you. <clears throat> they have bookshops, so they um, write the textbooks and stuff, but you have to buy them yourself. So, um, and dental equipments and things like that as well. So, you know, I mean, I'm now gonna go back and I'm treating patients. And although my university do provide the composite fillings, I prefer a more expensive brand only because my work comes out better. So I'm now gonna spend myself on things, just make my work better. So it's things like that. You can use what university give you, but sometimes it might not be at what you like in terms of the quality. So then you have to go to the dental shop and get things yourself and look around yourself and pay at your own pocket. So everyone's different, but not saying it's bad. Like the university's equipment is still good. Like I've used it before and my work has, it's not been faulty or anything like that. It's just, I feel like if I get myself used to brands that I might be using as a, when I'm working from early on, I'll benefit from it. So apart from composite, is there anything else you have to buy in terms of dental materials or dentistry stuff? No, um, the thing, things, oh, uh, we, in second year we have a big exam, it's a 16 hour exam uh, where you have to produce a denture from hand. This is the one exam that a lot of people unfortunately fail and don't continue with the course. And this is the one I was literally hanging by a thread. So you have to produce a denture from scratch, um, which they train you obviously to do. And um, that takes about half the time, I'd say three quarters of the time. And then the other time of the 16 hours is to do a wax up. So you have like a, a mold of teeth and you have to wax up, uh, drip wax and make the tooth anatomy perfect and let it occlude perfectly as well in the time given. And then they assess you on that and pass or fail you. So in terms of practicing for this, you have to buy your own equipment, like the wax needed for the denture rims or like the plastic teeth that you put in. So things like that are not too expensive. I mean, the thing is you have to remember as well, you're in Eastern Europe, a lot of things are cheaper. Um, I'd say the things that are not cheap are things that you'd use on patients themselves. For example, composite. Uh, because uh, you know, depending on the brand, uh, again, you have a very a big, op a big, um, uh, a lot of options. So like, you can either go for the top brand, German brand, expensive, or you can go for other brands that are not as expensive but still good. So it just depends on the person. You don't have to do this, by the way. The university do give you everything you need. Um, for example, you know the light curing machine. We have one in the room. We have two in the room, and there's nine. There's eight of us in the room. Now we've all got patients, so. I'm there with the composite and I have to wait for the light cure to be done by somebody, sterilize it and then use it. And two in a room of eight isn't that great, but what have I done about it? I'm now gonna get my own and buy that myself. Only because it's more comfortable for me. I don't need to, but I prefer, I prefer to do that. So yeah, I feel like um, the university do give you everything, but it just depends on the individual. If they want something easier, they can, if they want, get things themselves. And on the topic of money, um... What is the living cost like over there? It depends from individual to individual. Shopping wise, it's not that bad. Um, I mean, for example, we are in the currency of Lev, Bulgarian Levs. So per pound, it's like 2.19 exchange. So times two. So if I bring, for example, 10 pounds, I'll get maybe 22 Lev out of it. So, I mean, it's, it's all right. Um, grocery shopping isn't too bad. I'd say it's a little bit cheaper than the UK, but not crazy cheap. Um, so I'd say similar. Um, 
again apartments it depends which apartment you choose i mean some apartments go for 300 to 300 300 to 400 euros a month but then you can also go for 200 euros a month as well um the apartments you gotta pay in euros rather than levs because they know you're from the uk and they want euros from you so to live there but then obviously electricity and uh water bills is all included again it depends who you go for your landlord and yeah yeah, I suppose housing is one of those things that it, it depends what kind of life do you want to live. I mean, if, you, if you've got cash to burn, uh, you know, you go for a, for a luxury lifestyle that's enjoying your course as well. Or if you're maybe not, not from as, as a privileged background, um, then you just go for something that is quite standard, uh, like on a student level. But then, you know, a lot of students also share, so they can get a really nice apartment, but just share with a friend and split the costs. So you can do whatever you want, honestly. Like, these apartments, it's literally your own private accommodation. You can do whatever you want. You can live with whoever you want and decide on how you want to spend that money. That's the great thing about it. It's very, you know, you're very independent that way and you can make your own decisions. And the apartments, they're really nice. Like, even the ones that are, like, low cost, they're still very nice, very spacious, and you have a lot of room for yourself. And how often do you come back to the UK to visit your family? Uh, do you, how, what, what is a term like? Okay, let's start from the beginning of the year. So beginning of the year, you start maybe second week of September and then that term l l finishes December, uh, second week of December. Uh, but I sometimes go back in November for like five days. Um, I can spare five days. If I have any absences, I'll make up for them with my teachers. You just discuss it with your teachers and you say, can I take these days off? I'll make up for it. I'll write these essays for you. They'll say, okay. So if you have a good relationship with the teacher, you're fine. So yeah, I'll come back for five days, see everybody, have a, you know, just chill, eat whatever I can. Then I go back to Bulgaria, finish the semester. And then second week of December is when you come back home and obviously you've got Christmas. You need to prepare for your exams. So you're not just chilling as well, you're studying here as well. And then January, you've got to fly back to sit your exams so for example if you have like four exams you're there for like two weeks ish then after the exams finished you have two weeks holidays so then you come back again to the uk well that's what i do i come back to the uk again spend my two weeks here just relaxing and then i fly back to start the second semester which is february to end of april and then I sometimes also come back in Easter. So beginning of April, I think is Easter. I come back for like a week and then I go back again and then finish my semester off. And then summer is like end of May, uh, beginning of June. And how long, how long is the course? You said it's about six years, isn't it? Yeah, so um, let's just round to six years. So I started in 2017 and um, I will hopefully graduate in 2023. So the first two years you're just doing theory. So it's like a bit of dental and mainly medical. Third year, you have it's literally all dental. So you still got some medical subjects like microbiology, but it's also a lot of dental stuff. So you're starting your phantom heads and you know, you're starting cavity preps and plastic teeth. Fourth year, which is the year I'm in now, is when you start patients. And that's great. Like I love it. It's amazing. Like you literally you're a dentist, you know, you're finally doing something on a patient. Um, fifth year is next year, uh, more patients, a lot more points, a lot more pressure, and then sixth year is when you sit your state exam. So six years, just rotations. So they've got a separate building for the six year students, which is brand new. And um, I can't wait to use that because all, everything's brand new there. So it's like you do pediatrics rotation, conservative rotation, endodontics rotation, and you just go in like apparently like three hours a day and you're done because you know, you've already trained for that. So it's not too difficult. You're just getting the points. Then you sit your state exams in sixth year. Um, to qualify as a dentist in Bulgaria and then you get your diploma and you've graduated. That's really good. I mean, six years is quite a lot of time, you know, it's a, it's a long course. I mean, it's, it's only one year extra compared to the UK, but um, with the COVID-19 situation going on, the universities are actually looking at extending the course to six years. So that's one thing we've been told about. So it, it, yeah, potentially it could be six years, you know, you never know. But it's still, it's not something that is confirmed as of yet. Um, I know for fifth years it's it's confirmed, but not an extra year. It's just an extra six months, and um, for them to get more clinical exposure. But say um, you're in fourth year now. So say I'm I'm in, I'm in Bulgaria. I'm studying there. I'm in fourth year now, and then it's clinic time. How do I communicate? How do I talk to patients? In you know. Do they speak English? The more stressful thing about this is you start fourth year. I've been given a book for conservative dentistry. Okay, Hassan, you gotta get this many points. You need to get 
13 points for fillings, which is one pint per tooth service, and you need to get three points for endodontics. So, and I'm thinking, okay, where are the patients? And they say, you have to get your own patients. Good luck. So I'm like, oh my God. So I'm literally like, it's like I'm a private dentist and I have to recruit, try and get my own patients to come to me and trust me. Now, at first that was a bit difficult. I think for the first two weeks, I struggled a lot nobody was coming to me but now i love it i feel like you know it's teaching me to become my own business mind kind of thing like i'm trying to like to sell myself to try and get somebody to trust me and to come to me so wherever i go i mean i've been very blessed this semester i've had a lot of patients and I've, I've got all my points my teachers verified me and said you've done everything you need to do unfortunately a lot of students couldn't do that because of the covid situation uh, a lot of uh, patients weren't coming in so I've been very fortunate. So the way I do it is I've spent Sundays, we've reserved Sundays, me and my group, and we go, it's fun because we go around and we try talking to uh, uh, p people in Bulgarian. And it's just, it's funny because like we struggle sometimes and we laugh and they laugh, but a lot of people, you know, they give you their number and they do trust you. But the thing is you can get like, let's say 10 numbers, 10 phone numbers, but only one will actually turn up. You know, the rest won't come. They'll say they will, but they actually won't come. And that's a bit stressful because then you're sat in clinics without a patient and the teacher won't do anything. You're just not going to get signed for it, you know? So you've wasted a day in clinics and you only have one day a week for this. So you can't waste time. You need to get these points before the semester ends. This semester, this year, they've been okay. They've been lenient because of COVID. They said you don't have to get all the points, but I still wanted to get all the points. It's something I feel like I don't want to waste my time in the clinics. I need to get the experience. So funnily, funnily enough, uh, the days where I actually went out to look for patients, I didn't get any patients. But let's say it's 10 p.m. I finished swimming. I go at 8, 8 p.m. ish. Finishes at 10. It's dark. I'm walking home, and I see somebody walking down on my way home. I'll literally stop them. I'll be like, "Hi there, and do you need some? Do you need a free dental checkup? It's completely free. You can come to me." And I also use my Instagram now. So I say, "Follow me on Instagram. Check out the work I've done. Check out the reviews I got for my patients. And if you trust, if you trust that, that you can come to me. And then they'll DM me, and they'll be like, "Okay, I can come. Can I come on this day and time? And then I arrange your time." So this semester, I've focused on people who speak more English. Bulgarian but I still practice with them so one of the patients I had spoke very little English but I was still able to say words such as do you have pain or um, are you comfortable and whilst I'm doing my treatments I uh, sorry after I do my treatments I always ask my patients for feedback what could I have done better and um, I'm very happy because each every single patient I've had have said to me that you're very caring you every every step of the way you ask um, if I'm okay if um, you, if I need a break I can get a break from you um, if I'm in pain I, they can put the hand up you know I'm, I, I I really treat them special like I ask them every step of the way I mean usually you think as a student I'm so stressed I need to get the feeling right that's true at first I am stressed I need to get the feeling right and it's my first time doing it but my 50% of my head is also focused on the patient's well-being so I'm always stopping and asking and taking my time and now we only have like two and a half hours in the clinic room so we have to finish before then but yeah picking up patients is great learning Bulgarian I feel like the way I did it was I I just Google translated things and I learned these. So I wrote them on my phone and I memorized sentences. And the thing is, when you try speaking the language, they really appreciate it. And they, you know, they trust you even more because you're trying your best to speak to them. But if you really struggle, your teachers can help you. I mean, my teacher's amazing. She's awesome. I call her and I say, oh, um, can you just explain this procedure just so they understand? I mean, I've tried to explain myself, but I want them to fully understand what I'm going to do. And she'll just laugh. She'll say, yeah, okay, of course. And then they'll have the little Bulgarian joke about me. And then I'll be like, what did you say? What did you say? But no, it's, it's totally great. It's totally fine. This is the one thing I was very scared of. But so far, doing fourth year with patients, you know, it's been great. It's not been difficult at all. You just have to really put yourself out there and you have to have the confidence to approach where, whoever you can, but be ready to take no. Say, you know, be able to accept a no from somebody. At first it's a bit awkward, you know, you're on your own, you're asking someone and they're like, no, it's okay, thank you, we don't need a dentist. And you know, it feels a bit awkward, but you get used to it, you get used to it. Is that the marketing strategy to have an Instagram page and then that way you're like, you're putting yourself out there, you can potentially, you might even get one or two patients from there, you know? Yeah, it's happened. It, you know, I've been very fortunate from there, like, even if the patients say, um, no, thank you, I'll still say, okay, do you want to just follow my Instagram page and then share it to your friends? And I remember getting one of the Bulgarians, he was a young guy and he put it on his story and he wrote all in Bulgarian and I could read it and he was like, this student from the UK is offering free dental treatment, uh, message him if you're interested and, you know, 
um, one of my patients, he's been amazing. I've done his, he was the last patient I had before I came home and um, he messaged me and he said, you know, I have friends, um, can I recommend you uh, to them? And I said, of course you can, you know, I'll need patients. So, you know, I hand them over and I'll, I'll see what I can do. But it's, it's been great. I feel like more than just being a good dentist, if you're a good person and you're communicating with them, that's how you build trust. Because I see every patient as someone who's afraid of the dentist. Even though they might not be afraid, if you treat them as they're afraid of the dentist, you, you, you you're gonna be great, you know, you're, you're really putting them at ease because, you know, that's what matters first is that they trust you and they're safe and, you know, they're not scared or they don't regret choosing you. <laughs> that's the last thing you want. Yeah, yeah, uh, that's, that's really good. I mean, that, that is very important. And uh, building rapport with your patients and moving from there, it's so much better than just being there to treat the patient without building a relationship with them. Because once you build that relationship with them, chances are they'll always come back to you. They're never going to miss their appointment. And that is what we need to do, you know, as dental professionals, potentially. So moving on swiftly, is there a fast track route for graduates? You know, you said that it's six years, the course is six years. What if I've done biomedical sciences and I want to now jump into the third year or second year? Is that possible? I'm not entirely sure. I've not heard of anyone actually skipping years, but what I have heard is people who have ha have have degrees. For example, if you've done biochemistry degree, then you don't have to sit certain subjects. You're exempt from them, so you've basically got less exams to sit. But I don't think you can start from second year or third year. Maybe you can now, but. Um, I, I really don't know the answer to that question. The only thing I can um, confirm is if you have a degree, there are certain subjects you have to prove that you've sat um, that you can basically be exempt from and you don't have to study for them and you've got basically less exams to sit. You might be able to still start from second or third year. Um, I've just, I've not done a whole degree before. So um, if you do, you know, speak to the agencies or you can even contact the university themselves. The websites, just, you can, it's all in English. They have emails you can contact contact and speak to somebody and go from there yeah what about completing the degree is it is the degree recognized by the general dental council can you just come back to the UK and start working straight away so this depends on the university you choose to study at. Not all the universities are approved, accredited by the GDC. Um, the one I'm at, the reason I chose Plovdiv was, main reason was because it was on the list, uh, the GDC's list of universities they recognize. So I wanted to be 100% sure. Um, so. Um, about unis that are not on GDC's list, you can still work in the UK. It's just um, getting it recognised is a bit of a process um, in terms of getting your documents to them and asking them to verify everything. But you know, so many dentists um, I've spoken to in the UK have friends who have um, graduated from Bulgaria and Hungary and they're, they're all working and they've all been working really well in the UK. And when my orthodontist, um, He's a professor who teaches me, but he's also an orthodontist. Um, he he's Bulgarian, but he now works he works part time in Ireland in a private practice, and he's told us that he you know working in the UK is not an issue at all. Um, it's just you need to just get the documents ready and get them all translated, then you know you get your license number. And do you do you think that there are stereotypes in terms of you know when you apply to for a job? If they see you've studied in Europe, would they look at you? Do you think they'll look at you differently than when you've studied, you know, you graduated from a UK university? Um, you know, even last year, like I was still thinking about this, and I've asked everybody, and um, I've asked a lot of dentists that I know in the UK who are working, and uh, you know, who know or practice owners. And in terms of getting the GDC number, no, but in terms of applying for jobs, also no, because um, there's a girl who's just graduated. Uh, this year from my university. Um, she's really sweet. She did a webinar for us um, to help other students um, describing her, you know, now that she's work she's working as a dentist right now and she's already got a job and she's explained that there's no stereotypes whatsoever. It's all about you as an individual and how ready you are for the job. If you have a good portfolio and if you are ready to apply and if you are confident that you can produce great work, they, there's no reason why they shouldn't hire you. So it's all about the individual more than where you studied because I feel like a lot of students who study abroad, um, practice owners realize that these courses can be rigorous. They're not, you know, easy courses. Although they might be easier to get into, the courses themselves are pretty difficult. And the thing is we have, what I've been told by UK students is uh, we have more patient contact and more patient experience. Um, during our studies. So for example, I've seen about six patients this semester for one subject. 
in, in the semester. Now I'm supposed to be seeing six more for oral surgery for extractions, that didn't happen because of COVID. And I'm supposed to be seeing um, another two for prosthodontics in that one semester. Now when I start fifth year, that will double. I, I'm expected to see twice as many patients and then it will double again for sixth year. So by then I'll have so many patients under my belt and so many cases hopefully, then I feel like these are the things I wanna put into my portfolio and show. So it depends on the individual. You have to sell yourself. You have to show that you are willing to work hard, that you have worked hard abroad. And I feel like the fact that I'm abroad, it's gonna make me uh, more confident. Um, you know, I'm gonna. I'm not gonna think, oh, I studied abroad and I've got less chance. No, I'm gonna show that, yeah, I've studied abroad, but look at the cases I've done, you know? Look at what I've learned. I can bring this into your practice. So, yeah, from what I heard from, you know, a fresh graduate who's now working from my university, who's now working in London, um, there's no stereotypes so far, but it's just about selling yourself. That's really good because you said you have to actually find your own patience as well and that whole process, I think, it teaches you a lot. That's one thing we don't have to think about here, you know? We just, we just keep giving patience. And I feel like when there is something that you struggle with, you definitely learn a lot more. So if you go to a patient and they, you know, they don't call you back, you probably think to yourself, okay, what did I do wrong that they didn't call me? You know, maybe, maybe I didn't talk to them the right way. Maybe I should improve the, my speech or the way I talk to them or the way, you know, there's so many factors. No, no, this is why I literally, you know, usually what people do is after they're done with the patient, okay, goodbye, sign the form, goodbye, let's clean up. I literally spend a good 15 minutes chatting to them and my teacher's always like, Hassan, come on, hurry up, you need to go. And I'm just like, one second. And I'm literally interviewing them. Okay, please be honest, what can I have done better? And I think one of the patients said, "One, yeah, this one got to me. Like, not in a bad way, in a good way. He said, Hassan, you need to be more confident. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? And he goes, I saw your hands shaking. And when I scre he screamed in pain, I, it shook me a bit. And I, I, I jumped and I, I was a bit like startled. Everyone was staring at me into the, in the room. And I thought, oh my God, right, uh, are you okay? And he goes, yeah, I'm fine, fine. And he said, just be more confident. And then he came again and he goes, Hassan, 100%, you're great now. You're more confident, you, you know what you're doing. If you show the patient you know what you're doing, your, your patient's gonna trust you 100%. And I said, okay. So, you know what? It's great because you learn from your patients. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And how, how do you think, you know, with the Brexit will affect uh, whether you can come back and work in the UK or not? Because this is a hot topic now, you know. As of, as of this year we moved and Brexit actually happened. Even before I applied, Brexit was happening and I knew it. And I, I was coming to this university knowing Brexit was gonna happen and it couldn't affect me. But um, thus far, um, what we know so far is that it worst comes to worst if we are affected. Although our university is accredited by the GDC, there is a chance where we won't have to sit an extra exam. But worst comes to worst, we will have to sit the ORE exam. But you know, we, we, we were examined so much in our university. In fifth and sixth year, they're gonna be the busy, biggest exams in the university. They're gonna be huge and um, a, lot of, a lot of content. It'll be three years worth of content per exam. You know, conservative dentistry, endodontics, three years of stuff in one exam and I have to smash it, you know? And they're gonna be my state exams as well. And these are my final grades that are gonna be on my transcript. So I want to do really well in these. So imagine I spent all these months studying for these exams. What are another few exams gonna do? I know ORE is a big exam, but I, this is the way I think. I see the glass is half full rather than half empty. I just see it as, okay, I can do another set of exams. If anything, if I pass this, I know I'm good enough. Yeah, I suppose when you really want to do dentistry, you know, we, we all apply and we know exactly that we're going to have to do the UCAT exam and it's a tough exam. We're going to have to get through interviews. We're going to have to see how many exams during this degree. And why do we do? Why do we put ourselves through? It's because we really want to do it, right? And it's the same thing. If you have one extra exam, that's totally fine. Yeah, exactly. And like you think about it, you spent five years, six years studying, and learnt one more set of exams just working in the UK. I'm pretty sure it's worth it. So, I mean, I, personally, I hope it, you know, it doesn't happen. But if it does happen, I can do it. I mean, I spoke to my siblings, and I remember when it was announced. It was only a couple of months ago where it said, you know, that we might have to sit the ORE. I messaged my brothers and sisters, and um, they work as um, as doctors, so you know, they know a lot of people who have come from abroad, and you know, from India and um, Pakistan, and, and they've had to sit these rigorous exams and I said oh my god guys I'm gonna sit this I'm gonna sit this but they said you can do it like it's just one more set of exams just get it done you know work hard at university and it'll be worth it and I said you know what yeah you're right and I thought to myself I thought yeah I'm not gonna let this get to me let me just focus on one thing at a time and Brexit will happen it'll happen if anything I feel like everything happens for a reason so you know I'm ready to take it on <laughs> I'm ready to take it on yeah and 
This is one thing I've heard. I don't know if it's true or not, but it's one thing that I was thinking about when I wanted to apply to Europe,、um, and that is corruption. Do you think there is any corruption there?、Um, I remember when I was applying, that was on my head. That was literally a hot topic on my head: the corruption. Because obviously, my biggest fear was going abroad, studying, and then this happening. And that's not where a, a university I wanted to go to. But、um, You know, I'm in my fourth year now, and I've not heard of anything like that in my university. My exams are very difficult. You know, we have、um, MCQ section. Okay, everyone says MCQs. You study for it, you're fine. You have an essay section. You got to write an essay, fine. But then you also have an oral section. Now, the oral is the most daunting part because they can ask you anything, and they will keep asking you questions. And if you don't know the answer to one of them, they will send you home. They will literally say, "Go home." And it's happened to me. I failed exams, and it's very, very disheartening. Like. There's literally times where I've literally said, "Please don't fail me" to their face, and they just be like, "Get out! You're not ready. Get out!" And、uh, you know, at the time, it was really depressing. And I'm thinking, all that time studying, I have to do this exam again. And if I don't pass this exam, I can't get to the next year. So you know, I've had these stresses, but you know, and that's what made me think that this university really just pushed me because that's made me work ten times harder for my reset, and I passed it with a higher grade. So you know. From my personal experiences and the stress I've been through with failing exams in this university, I, I can't. I've not. I can't say there's corruption in my university because of how strict they are with me. You know, I've had professors literally tell me to my face, "You don't know enough. You're not ready. Get out." You know, in a very strict way. And it, you know, but it's it strengthened me as a person. And the biggest biggest exam I'd say that really really strengthened me was in my second year, end of second year, and I almost failed the year. I almost had to leave. University because of prosthetics, the 18-hour exam. I sat it the first time. I didn't pass, and I asked why. They didn't tell me. They said you just it, it's not good enough. And then I sat it the second time, 18 hours again, and I didn't pass. And that really got to me. And I, Eve, I remember stressing to my teacher, and I, I was shouting. I said, "What do they want from me? This is the dent I've made. What's wrong with it? And do you want me like I can't fail? Like I can't go home? And、um, it was." It was literally like a mental breakdown, and he had to calm me down. And he goes, Hassan, if you are like this, you're not going to survive at this university. They are strict. They want the perfect, the best of the best work. You do this one more time, and let's. See, if you pass it, you'll it'll, it'll happen. So I said, okay, fine. And this is the third time is your last chance, by the way. They call it liquidation period, and if you don't pass it in liquidation, you're going home. And I remember passing that, and it was very very scary because obviously I hadn't told anybody at home, guys. I'm on a thread, by the way. I might have. I might have to return to the UK, so you know I'm very grateful I passed it. And I remember going in, and he said, "You've made the best entry I've ever seen, and it's improved." And I remember thanking him. I said, "Thank you because that's taught me a lot about myself and how I need to improve certain aspects." Because now doing those dentures has. Somehow help me with my patience. I'm now more careful with my work、uh, because I'm staring at teeth so many times, building these dentures during practice. That has helped me in other aspects of dentistry. And、um, unfortunately, that time I remember there are people who failed the year in front of me. And I remember it was an oral exam, and somebody before me he said, "Go home, you failed the year." And I was scared because I was next, and he's just failed somebody in front of me. And I remember I was shaking, and he said to me, "If you get this question wrong, you're failing the year." And、uh, I remember I got it right, obviously, but that was a game changer for me at this university. This showed to me that they do not play around. They don't just pass people for fun. They need the top, the best of the best, and you have to show you've worked hard for it. And I remember bringing in my pile of notes, and he was looking at it, and he laughed and he goes, "This isn't going to make me pass you. I'm going to ask you all the questions now." And I said, "Okay," <laughs> and you know. So in general. Four years been there, not heard of any corruption,、uh, which is great, you know. And the fact that these teachers are so strict, a lot of people will say that's a negative. I see that as a positive, because I know I'm getting the best education I can get. You know, these people、uh, are great at their work. They've got their own patience. You know, they know everything, and they're being so strict on me because they want me to be the best I can be. Yeah, I think as a student, you know. You want you want things to be easy, but at the same time, if they're too easy, how is that going to make you better? Exactly. It's just it's more scary. You know why it's more scary? Because I'm not in England. I'm in a foreign country with foreign rules. And if they decide to fail me, I can't do anything about it. I have to go home. There's no there's not appealing. There's no there's nothing like that there. So、um, if anything, I am forced to work hard, which is great. 
I think that's great, you know, and it will make me a better dentist when I'm working. Yeah, which I'm sure, you know, they, they, they must have a process. They don't, they don't just fail people for the sake of just failing them. They have a process and if you put the work in and you work hard, you know, you, there is no reason why would they fail you, you know, you get through it. Yeah, I mean, I'm not just saying to scare people, I'm just being honest. Like, if you, you know, if you're not putting the right work in, they will see it, you know. They don't just pass anybody they want. They, no, they, they really do assess your ability to, you know, you know, to know the specification, to know the topics and to know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. I think this video definitely turned out to be longer than expected. Thank you so much for for doing this and there's so much information, there's lots of value for somebody, you know, you've definitely answered a lot of questions that I had when I wanted to uh, apply to Eastern Europe. So thank you so much for that. I'm gonna give you the stage for the last couple of seconds or minute if you wanna promote anything. Yeah, thank you. No, thank you for having me. And if anyone is interested in studying abroad, just remember I was in your shoes four years ago. I was very scared, I was very lost. I didn't know what to do. You know, I was on my own. I mean, obviously you have your family with you, which obviously you guys will have and friends, but ultimately this is your future. So if you do have any questions about studying abroad, it doesn't even have to be about Bulgaria. I feel like studying abroad anywhere can help answer that question. Then just hit me up on my Instagram. It's Dental Hassan. Um, and I'm more than happy to answer questions and guide and help people. All right guys, so thank you so much for watching. This is the end of this video. I hope you've enjoyed it and you actually found some value in it. If you did, please let me know by liking, commenting, and subscribing to the channel. If you have any questions, I don't study in Eastern Europe, so I study at the University of Dundee, but I'm going to put Hassan's Instagram details down in the description box below. So check it out. And if you have any questions, you can directly DM him and ask him whatever questions that you have. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. Take care and I'll see you guys in the next video. Peace.